any new projects I'm working on or anything. But since I am a fanboy that works in the industry, we can tackle two birds with one stone, and I can talk about both things. So, uh, that being said, someone is gonna come run in here in a minute with a bottle of Gatorade for me so I don't fall out and die during this panel. Uh, so I guess I'll do the boring part first and do the introduction, the teasing introduction. Uh, I was hoping I could announce a new big role this weekend, but they're making me wait till next weekend at Anime Boston. So I've decided to up the hinting level to like 11. So, uh, so I'll be dropping hints all throughout the weekend. And if you guess it, I can't say yes, but I might smile. So, uh, Cause I can't say anything until next weekend. Anyway, uh, so my name is Greg Harris. Uh, I am a voice actor most of the time, troublemaker the rest of the time. And uh, I live and work out of Texas. I, I started working for ADB Films back in uh, 2000? That's a long time ago. Uh, and I was an anime fan before I did that, which is funny because I was a dub hating anime fan. <laughs> I was that. I'm an anime fan. 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 Well, guess what? When you hate on something that hard and that bad, you might end up doing it for a living. So that's what I do for a living now. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that I, I've been roughly working for uh, the anime industry for the last 15 years, which is creepy because it's the longest I've stayed at any job now. Um, but uh, in doing so, uh, I started working. I was, I was uh, my first foyer into dubbing was a show called Steel Age of Kurumi, which is so do naughty that they can't show it in England, which I find amusing and fun all by itself. Um, <laughs> I was the first person to curse in that show, so I feel very accomplished. Um, and then they kept telling me, they're like, we have this other role for you, it's really cool, you have a weird voice. And I was like, thanks. Uh, and when I found out, they said I was going to be sharing a role with Claudia Black. I was like, the hot Australian lady from Farscape? How is that going to work? Well, it turns out, uh, my character was this very yaoi-ish villain, a theme that would follow me my whole career. Uh, <laughs> even in real life. Uh, yaoi, the great hair is yaoi villain. Anyway, uh, so, uh, the jokes have already started. I haven't even had a drink today yet. Um, so anyway, uh, I play this uh, kind of yaoi-ish boy who is trying to convince the main lead to disable his robot angel that happens to have very large capacity for memory, and uh, <laughs> when he will not turn his robot off, my character backs him into a corner and kisses him and turns into a giant big-breasted female robot, which is played by Claudia Black. So uh, that's how I got started. My next role will be another show for uh, uh, Sentai, uh, Sentai, it was ADV, a long time ago. Uh, but this is one of my first experiences of what would be one of the weirder things about this job. I went in to audition for a show that was called Paradise Raiders. And is that Powerade for me? Oh my god. Thank you, Ryan. Powerade. It's not the same as Gatorade, but it's red. It's red, and that's all that matters. Oh my god, I'm so much better already. Okay, so um, I went in to audition for a show called Paradise Raiders. Never heard of a show called Paradise Raiders. Never even heard of anything like it. But when I looked at the script, the characters' names were San Goku, uh, Sha Gojo, Genjo Sanzo, and I was like, this sounds like Sayuki. And so I asked them, I was like, is this Sayuki? And they're like, that's not what we're calling it. It has to be called Sayuki. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, luckily they came to their senses and it was called Sayuki. Uh, but it would be the first time I would ever have that weird argument with the people I work for. Uh, it would happen years again later, and you'll be happy to know they fixed this too. Years later when I was working for Funimation, and we were working on a show called Kodacha, they wanted to pronounce the main character's name. Are you ready? 
Santa, which sounds a lot like Santa Claus. I was like, her name is Sana. No, it's Santa. No, it's Sana. I promise you, it's Sana. It's Santa. Yeah, I know, but you always pronounce it wrong. I can't tell directors that. They don't like to be told they're wrong. I even remember when uh, Monica's character, that is my little girlfriend, she's like my little girlfriend, uh, the, the character's name was spelled A-Y-A, -A, which is what? Aya, correct. But I had to say her name was Aya. And I was like, no, that's not the way that name sounds at all. Well, no, we said it Aya in Fruits Basket. I was like, and it was wrong in Fruits Basket. <laughs> so again, don't tell people they're wrong, they don't like that. Uh, so anyway, I would continue to work in the industry for multiple studios for a long time. And in that time period, I've gotten to answer a lot of my own questions about why something is different. In fact, I remember being that uh, totally too much time on my hands fan that would watch something in Japanese, or watch something in English with the subtitles turned on just to try to ch get mistakes. <gasps> they, they did it, they did it. Look, that word is, no, 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 I'm, I'm pointing at the virtual air. I'm saying as a kid, I'm like, uh, look, it says the, and they clearly said a. So, uh, I got to learn a lot about how the process worked. Oh, stop it. Um, there's this trick we use in the booth that looks like this, but every picture taken looks so weird if I did this for the panel. So I will do this. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm getting bored of talking. I can ask me questions first, because uh, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out how to do both panels in one. I'm not used to this. Who's got a question, quickly? Before I, oh no. Oh yes, yay, Kellen, thank you. Here's it um, For some of the, uh, like you were saying, some of the flag that you give people from this pronunciations and whatnot, um, has that ever created a difficult situation when it came to actually working or any potential future employment? Yeah, actually it does. In fact, a friend of mine just started working as a voice actor, and he speaks a little Japanese. And he said, uh, I get a lot of flack at the studio uh, because I correct them. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> and he goes, but they want it. I was like, don't do that. If you want to keep working, don't do that. And that's really hard. You have to... It's a delicate balance trying to get somebody to correct a mistake. Uh, for years, I was the new type magazine guy. Oh, yeah, real Gatorade. I've got the best of both worlds, like Powerade and Gatorade. Man. Oh my gosh, and it's not even G2, it's G. Yeah. This is the best day ever. I'm like a kid with Kool-Aid now. You're on the spot. Uh, but there's a really delicate balance. Like I said, when I first started doing the New Type USA, when we had the magazine New Type USA, I was that obnoxious guy on all the posters, centerfold, manga, DVD. Like, they wanted me to say manga. And I was like, no, I can't say manga. And it took a good, like, ten minutes to convince somebody to say it correctly. And once we did it, like, that, that commercial was on every single disc that ADB put out. So imagine if it was wrong. Uh, but then again, I've had directors tell me to shut up, and they didn't care how it was done in the Japanese. And so you have to be really careful. Um, it bothers me the most as a fan, because as a fan, I don't want any show to get ruined. Uh, and I can't say what show, because I can't announce it yet. But I just worked on a show where I had to watch the show in Japanese first, just because uh, I needed to do some research on it. And there was a line when we got to record it that was wrong. I mean wrong and like changed the plot wrong. Wow. And I said, I like I said the line as it was written and you could see I'm one that can't hide. Like I go from zero to ghetto in about five seconds. <laughs> so like when I'm angry, you can feel the heat coming off my skin. And I was sitting in the booth just like <sighs> and so the director goes, Let's take a break. And so on the break I was like, hey, can we go around the side of the building and talk for a second? And I pulled the director aside and I said, Look, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but this is going to piss every fan of this show off. I said, this is wrong, and it's wrong in a way that fans are going to really freak out. And he went back in and talked to somebody else, and they're like, okay, we're going to skip the scene, and we're going to come back to it. And when we recorded it the next day, it was fixed, and it was accurate to the translation. <laughs> uh, but again, I wouldn't have even caught that had I not done my homework ahead of time and watched the show. So it's a, tough, it's a tough job to correct somebody, especially when it's the person that's going to hire you later. <laughs> When you're gonna hire somebody, would you hire that guy that keeps telling you you're wrong? No. So, uh, yeah. Well, 
And that's the thing, you have to find that balance. You have to find a way to say, hey, can I tell you something for a second without going, no, you're wrong. And unfortunately, at the beginning of my career, I was very much a no, you're wrong guy. And it's taken me a long time to figure out how to get those things uh, across. Now, I work for some studios that are totally collaborative. Uh, I, when I, for instance, when I work for my brother, my brother is one of those directors that would always want to hear your idea. Because he always thinks, well, I'm an actor, so I'm probably going to do it one way. How would you do this? And so when I work with somebody like that, it's really easy. You can always give them input. And uh, luckily at Sentai, we have a guy that works as a translator for both Funimation and ADV. And he's also an actor. His, his, his name is Clint Bickham. And so my brother will constantly call Clint Bickham and go, hey, I don't get this joke. Is this a you know, cultural difference or what? And Clint will usually explain it to my brother. But uh, it doesn't always work that way. And, some, and some, of the, some of the harsh part about it is it is a business. You have so many weeks to get certain shows out. Uh, I did a show for Sentai Filmworks called, oh crap, what's the earthquake show? Uh, Tokyo Magnitude. Tokyo, Tokyo Magnitude. I was, all I can remember is Magnitude 8.0, Tokyo Magnitude 8.0. To give you an idea how fast some DVDs are produced, um, I went in on a Tuesday to finish recording Tokyo Magnitude 8.0, which is not a happy show, by the way. It's a very, every, it's a very sad show everywhere. Um, but I say so it was Tuesday. The following Friday, I was coming in to work on From the New World, and they handed me my disc for Tokyo Magnitude 8.0. And I was like, what is this? And they're like, Tokyo Magnitude 8.0. I was like, just the first half? But no, the whole thing. I was like, I just recorded this. And they're like, yeah, it's done. So there are times when the turnaround is ridiculous. There's times when we have to get something out super quick. When we were working on Shikabani Hime for Funimation, we were doing, uh, it, wasn't simul it wasn't true simulcast like they're going to be doing with uh, a lot of the new shows, but it was the first time we were allowed. My phone is being rude. I'm about to turn it off. I need to go silent. Stop. Uh-oh, uh that's my bank. <laughs> now I turned it off anyway, it's okay. Uh, but uh, when we were doing Shika Bonahime, it was the first time that we could do a show that violated the 11 week rule. There used to be a law in Japan that you couldn't start working on a show that aired on television in Japan until 11 weeks after it had finished airing. The problem was all the bootleggers were getting a jump start on everything. And so Funimation worked really hard to get past that 11 week ruling doing a simulcast of Shikibani Hime, uh, or Corpse Princess. And uh, so when we were doing that show, we were rocking those episodes as fast as we could because they had to be uh, not even out, but they had to be up on YouTube a certain time on the Funimation channel. So uh, sometimes it's just a matter of time. You only have so much time to do something. and. Uh, but you can do a show well and quick. And a perfect example is, uh, how many of you have seen the show number six? Yay, I love that show. Uh, it's Yowie for beginners. <laughs> it's not really Yowie, but there's a bromance -y kind of thing. Anyway, uh, that show is 12 episodes long, and we recorded, I recorded, I have the lead in that show, and I recorded that show in 12 hours. So you can do a lot of work really fast if you've got a good script and you've got a director that knows what they're doing. Uh, but you know, some shows you get to take your time on. So uh, yeah, who's got another question? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing will ever be as fun as ghost stories. For those of y'all that don't know, I did this show a long time ago for uh, ADV Films called Ghost Stories. It was based on a Japanese show called Ghost Stories in High School that really sucked. And uh, it was so bad, in fact, that no one would buy it. They tried to sell it to all of the American distributors and nobody would have it. Uh, not Gideon, not, not Central Park Media wouldn't even take it. Media Blasters wouldn't take it. They're like, they're just like, nope, no. Uh, and they approached, I think, ADV three times. And on the third run, they said, hey, look, you can do whatever you want with this show. And they said, sold. <laughs> So we couldn't do, so as much as people think we just did whatever we wanted, there were rules to what we did to the show. Uh, we could not change any of the character names because, uh, you know, it had to stay true to the show. Uh, my character, I think, was the only exception because in the original Japanese, his name was Ryo, and it was obvious his name was Leo. It was just an LR thing. Uh, we could not change the name of any of the Japanese or Chinese ghosts because they're based on real Japanese and Chinese ghost legends. 
and we had to kind of stick with the story, meaning like if we had to go into a haunted tunnel and exercise a demon by like peeing on a bus or whatever, we had to do that. But if we had to say a magical chant, we didn't have to say the same magical chant that they said. So I think one of the chants we came with, I think the original was something like Katabe, Katabe, go away, Katabe, Katabe, you can't stay, which is, again, sucks. And uh, so ours was, I think, Katabe, Katabe, kick the bucket, Katabe, Katabe, you can suck it. Uh, <laughs> But the fun thing is, everything other than that, we were allowed to do whatever we wanted. And we made fun of everybody, we made fun of each other. At one point we said Hillary was pregnant with Vic's baby. Uh, Monica made a joke about Chris Patton and I with both of us in the scene, but they were saying Chris Patton and Greg Ayers, and we were Leo and Hachi, so uh, it's, it's hysterical. But uh, So we were allowed to do a lot, and we wrote the show as we went along. So that said, it was fun. It, the nothing will ever be that much fun. The funniest thing is Monica and I premiered the, the first dub at Oticon uh, the year it came out, and we got booed off the stage. And I love it, because some actors have egos that bruise like the skin of an onion. You know, how dare you boo me? Monica and I laughed. We were like, we're getting booed. <laughs> and like, we just walked off the stage, we're like... <laughs> But the funniest thing about that show is even though we were booed off stage and, you know, the critics, of course, go to the internet immediately and they're like, I can't believe anyone would make fun of such a serious anime as ghost stories in high school. But we beat Full Metal Alchemist for dub of the year that year. And they, so, uh, they call it a little dub that could, actually. So it's really funny uh, how well... Now, the funniest thing is... The, the producer and director, Stephen Foster, and I had this idea because anime fans made this almost Rocky Horror status. I mean, anime fans turned it into like a cult hit. And people, like, I know there's a Ghost Stories drinking game. Uh, there is, uh, there's a bootleg disc. Somebody brought a bootleg of Ghost Stories and I was like, I don't know whether to be offended or like a little tickled with myself. Like, this is a show nobody cared about. Like, this was the worst show ever. And, uh, my favorite is I was doing, I was, because I also am a DJ and I do a lot of music stuff outside of conventions and I was, at a, I was at a big festival thing that I was playing and there was a guy backstage and he's like, oh, you're the anime guy? And I was like, yeah, he goes, yeah, I like anime, but I watch it subtitled. I was like, oh, well, I don't care how you watch it as long as you don't, didn't steal it off the internet. And he's like, yeah, well, I do that too. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And he goes, yeah, there is one dub I like, but it's a fan dub. And I was like, Ugh. yeah, what's the fan dub? He goes, it's called Ghost Stories. I'm like, Dude, that's not a fandom. Yeah, it is. I go, no, I play the little Jewish kid. It's not a fandom. Like, you do sound that like that little Jewish kid. I'm like, I am that little Jewish kid. So, like, I love that somebody even thought it was a parody of the real thing. That's how funny it was. But, um, so, Stephen and I said we would like to redub it every five years. Because we make fun of everybody. And when we did the show originally, uh, let's see, Ash, uh, no, uh, what's her name? Lindsay Lohan was sober. We didn't have, we didn't have Sarah Palin or any of Ted Cruz or any of those guys. I played the little Jewish kid. Med Mel Gibson's ass is mine. Like, I was like, <laughs> Mel Gibson. And sadly, the show did so well that the Japanese took the rights back to the show for a while. And they were going to sell, they, I think they were going to Blu-ray it, and then that didn't happen. And the discotheque just rescued the license, and now you can buy the whole show for like 35 bucks in the veterans room. In fact, somebody brought one to the autograph signing. They're like, I bought this last year after you talked about this in a panel and it changed my life. Yeah, there it is. There it is. And I wrote, I wrote on the box, it says, screw Mel Gibson, Jews rock. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, there is never going to be a show that is that much fun to work on because we were the writers of the show. And in fact, if you look in the credits, our names all, if you look at all the writers, they're all the people in the show. Um, but yeah, fantastic show, really fun, really, really fun show. Uh, who's got another question? There were several last time. Uh, yeah. What's it like working on a show where you have a different character than normal, like Lutz from Dormant God? Oh man, I love Lutz, and he wouldn't stop getting shot in the ass. <laughs> uh, but I love it, because everything I sign, I just like, ow, my ass on everything. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I mean, that's the cool thing about being an actor. Like, there's some, there's some actors that don't like getting typecast, like Spike Spencer. If you ask Spike Spencer about Shinji Ikari, he's like, because eh, he doesn't like playing wimpy characters. There is no shortage of wimpy characters in anime, and I am very happy to be that guy. That's how I keep working. But when somebody comes to me with like a weird character or something that's really out of keeping with what I do, 
there's the initial fear as an actor, like, uh, no, I normally play little kids. And Eric Vale has my best quote when I when they brought me in to work on uh, uh, Case Closed. I still try to call it Detective Conan. Uh, when they brought me in to work on Case Closed, I was like, oh, there's probably a bunch of little kids in this show. That's cool. And he brought me in to play this mustached bank robber. And I was like, uh, he goes, okay, you're going to be playing this guy, uh, the guy with the black mustache. I was like, uh, have you have you heard my work, Eric? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you do a bunch of stuff at Bevin shows. I'm like, yeah, I play little kids, too. He goes, oh, I mean, you don't want to give this a shot? And that's the best way to call my bluff, is like, double dog dare me to do something. <laughs> Sure, I'll do it. And so uh, my favorite was working, and this was like one of my fanboy dream comes true. I got to work with Carl Masick before he passed away, who was the creator of Robotech. And um, which is funny because anime fans hated Carl Masick, and what I loved about Carl is he could enjoy that. He's like, oh, so you're, you're an old school anime fan, aren't you? I was like, yeah. He's like, so you probably think I'm the Antichrist. I was like, well, I like the originals better. And I was like, even kind of rude when I met him. But the thing is, uh, uh, he had a different way of working, and, and so anyway, long story short, he hired me to play this giant ochre in a show, and I was like, Carl, I have a little squeaky voice. He goes, oh, we'll just scream really loud. And like, <laughs> <laughs> like, if I'm not macho, just scream, and it'll fix it. So, uh, But as an actor, you can't be afraid to do something. Like, You, can't, you have to kind of go for it. Uh, this new show that I cannot tell you about, I will drop my first hint, uh, Recently, there was a show that I auditioned for. I say recently, we auditioned for it over a year ago. Um, full of kids. Which is tough for me, because you get to pick usually three characters you want to audition for. And so, it's all kids. Like, well, I could be any of these guys. I always sound like a kid. And then there was a villain. And I was like, let's be the villain. Let's, let, I'm gonna send in an audition for the villain, just to see what it's gonna be like. The weird thing is, like, I just pulled something weird out of, like, thin air. I was like, uh, because I know better. I played a serial killer in Gantz. I play a 16-year-old serial killer. And I know that when you play a villain, you're not supposed to, uh, you know, you're not supposed to over-villain. In fact, if you make a weird choice, it's usually more unsettling. So I did something weird, and I got cast as the villain in this show that's going to be coming out. We're going we're gonna to announce it next weekend. But it's probably one of my favorite characters I've ever played. Uh, the coolest villain ever. The funniest villain ever. So yeah. So, and number one. Uh, <laughs> chew the scenery. Yeah, chew the scenery is an understatement with this villain. This villain is un like you cannot avoid this villain at any cost. This villain is everywhere you look. So, uh, ooh, that's too big of a clue. Anyway, who's got another question? Yes. Um, other than upcoming shows that yeah. you can't talk about, yeah. do the studios ever put limitations on what you can do at panels? Well, yes and no. Um, we obviously, when we sign contracts, we sign that we won't give away certain trade secrets right. and certain titles and stuff like that. That being said, for a long time, the studios didn't even take conventions what we did at convention seriously. They only have started looking at it from a marketing perspective in the last five or six years, which is weird to me, because Monica and I used to say, there are people that know she and I better than like David and Janice and people at ADV Films, like when they were, because the voice actors were just everywhere. And it, for a while, it was just Monica, Chris, and I everywhere. Monica, Chris, Pat, and I. In fact, Vic called us the trifecta, so, which we made our own little gang sign, because if you're going to be called names, you have, you have to have a gang sign. So um, anyway, uh, so uh, now, I mean, obviously, if you were a horrible, like, mean, awful person, and you were, no, actually, there's, there are people that get away with that, too. Uh, I think studios would probably step in if you were tarnishing their reputation, but at the end of the day, we're actors, and just like if Mel Gibson wants to, to scream and cuss at his ex-wife on the answering machine, nobody's going to really take that out on 20th Century Fox or Miramax. It's just, wow, that guy has totally lost his mind. <laughs> and so I think we actors fall into that category too, but there are times when we're, our behavior is called into question and people will, people will call you and say, hey, can you talk to me about this? Yeah. And um, believe it or not, I, of the the horrible reputation, the like Amy Winehouse, Courtney Love reputation that I have, I really have never gotten in trouble with the studios. The only time I was ever told to shut up by somebody I worked for uh, was after Jenny on acquired the rights to Sayuki Reload. 
and they lied to a room full of people about why they couldn't cast the original actors. They said that we were unavailable. We were never contacted. And so I'm like, no, they're absolute liars. Well, I can't say that out loud. You, know, you can sprinkle gl glitter on a turd, but isn't it still a turd? Like, so, wow, that was not an all ages. Yeah, it was, turd is not a dirty word. And I put glitter on it, so it was okay. Uh, but I don't know how to call somebody a liar without calling them a liar. And so I, I got pretty opinionated about it just because as a fan of that show and as a fan of the manga ka, like, I just thought it was really scummy to tell people one thing and then not do it. Because when they originally announced the show, the, the word was, we have no intentions of using the original actors. That's what they said. I was at the convention when they announced it. I locked myself in my room and cried about it. I was all like, ooh, you know, like, because I loved that show. So, like, when they turned, you know, when it backlashed on them and fans were like, why didn't you use them? Oh, they weren't available. I was like, bullshit. Like, I was the first <laughs> one to say something. And that's the only time I've ever been told to keep quiet or whatever. And it was, and that's like a, a game of protocol. That's like, you know, a Cold War situation where you don't want to upset the studio. But I've never been like, you can't have an opinion on this or you can't say this. Um, as it, <coughs> following along with what we were talking about, about part of, part of doing this job is working for people and having people like what you do and people like working with you. There are times when you might be tempted to venture into a conversation, but you can't. Uh, and my social media situation is really weird because of the number of people that watch what I say. And so, uh, so at least I've always been aware of that. And I guess that's my background is in marketing. Like my degree is in marketing and advertising. So like, I kind of know not to do certain things online and what I know when I, if I'm going to play drunk internet, that it has to be obvious that it's drunk internet and not like just ragey, angry Greg on the internet. It's like, man, there's no Moscato left. And then you play drunk internet, you don't like, like somebody that's just angry. So, um, not that I've ever drank a whole bottle of Moscato and gotten on the internet. I, I like to answer hate mail when I'm drunk. It's the best time to do it. Best time ever. Cause like, what do you do with all that hate? You know, like, and I, I, and I deal with everything from like simple hate letters to like totally ridiculous. I'm actually, the first guy that threatened my life on Twitter, I'm actually getting a tattoo to commemorate it. <laughs> because there's this, and anybody, any music fans in the room? Okay, so like, there's this one style of DJ that for the type of music they play, they're the angriest people in the world and it's called happy hardcore. <laughs> So if it's called Happy Hardcore, why are you so mad? And that's what it's gonna say. I'm gonna get in little cutesy block letters. If it's called Happy Hardcore, why are y'all so mad? But, uh, but yeah, like, uh, it's, it's one of those things. But like, I had, I mean, some of them are innocent. Like I had a little girl write to me like, Dear Craig Ayers, I am so mad at you because you said Kaori Hitachi is gay. Kaori Hitachi cannot be gay because in, epi or in volume seven of the manga, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh my God. And so like, <laughs> Dear Michelle, well, of course, Kaori Hitachi is not gay because he is not real. Love, Craig Ayers. <laughs> not straight either. She's not real. So, uh, but yeah, like, I mean, you gotta have fun with it. But the studios, luckily, the studios know that we're individuals and and that our own bad behavior falls on our own head. So, uh, so yeah, luckily, no, nobody's done that yet. Uh, who's got a question? Yes? When is the hate mail panel? Man, you know what? Uh, Brianna, Brianna Lawrence, who is a cosplayer that's gonna be on my It Gets Better panel tomorrow, she has, for her panel tonight, she's a plus-size cosplayer who's also a woman of color, and so she gets not just hatred, but like body-shaming, bigoted, racist, she prints them out and she's going to read them tonight at her panel. Uh, and if anybody has taught me how to deal with hatred and ignorance, it's Brianna. Because she's like, oh my gosh, wait till you hear this. And she like has fun with it. And I think now that I do it like that, like now that I know that when it's time to answer hate mail that we get a bottle of Moscato or whatever, it suddenly doesn't become serious. And like my friend has a quote, and I can't use the real words, but I'll say, the biggest wussies always draw their swords on the internet, meaning the stuff you hear on the internet is so like, Rob Swire from Pendulum has my favorite quote on it. He said, if I had to imagine what the average YouTube commenter looked like, 
it would be a little green troll pissing on everything in front of itself. <laughs> like, if you put it in those terms, you can't be angry. You're like, oh yeah, that's what he does. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, some people, I mean, like, there's some actors that have got some super hate mail, and you're like, it's weird. You, just, you know, I don't go scream at somebody when they're selling insurance or, you know, filing taxes or whatever. So I think it's weird that somebody hates something that I do. Uh, but yeah, maybe, but you know what, maybe we'll do that. That's a great idea for a panel. I, dramatic readings of hate mail. <laughs> maybe that's one of my panels for next year. I'll, I'll have to go dig through the, like, the scourge of my hate mail. That would be fun. There's a, there's a con that has dramatic forum post readings, and it is my favorite panel. They're like, I can't believe the maid cafe closes at three, and they're like, it's real dramatic. Like, it's, there's no drama on the forums ever. So, uh, yeah. Who's got another question? Yeah. Sam, so, you were saying a lot of times as, um, a, a, as a voice, and more, even more before that, a fan, that you have disagreements with the directors about how it should be translated. Well, see, we don't ever meet the translators, and the translators almost always get it right. It's... There's, there's a three-step process. So when we get raw material from Japan, it is, comes in literally raw format. We just get video and something called M&Es, which is music and effects. So if there's like a, you know, a, an evil cow, you're like, and the music, and that's it. And there's nothing else. So, so those are the only things we get. The original that is the studio mix, music and effects. Sometimes promotional materials at that point, they usually don't come in until later. And so that goes to a translator. Uh, and that person translates the Japanese into English. That's the person that does the initial translation. Where it gets screwed up a lot of times is the second process called ADR, which is the adaptive script writing. That person's job is to look at the original raw translation, look at how many times the mouth flap hole opens and closes, and write something that is as closely accurate that will fit in those flaps. And the problem is, some people use it as a creative writing exercise. And they're like, oh, that's not funny enough. I'm going to write a joke here. No, there was no joke in the original. Let's just keep it the way it was. So that's usually where the process is, is a little screwy. And I've done some adaptive script writing. I worked on Gantz and Gravion. I will tell you, if you ever wanted to hate the Japanese language track, work as an adaptive script writer. <laughs> work as an adaptive script writer. Because your job is to listen to a line sometimes a hundred times until you get it until you find something that works just right and I will tell you those little cute Japanese girl voices are not so cute like the 60 or 7th time the 60 or 70th time you're like shut up so uh, like that said uh, like that process is difficult and, I, and it's why I only did it for a while because I knew that it's something that required a lot of attention and I couldn't do it for a long time and care like at all like it's so hard. It's, it's probably for an average script for a 20 minute episode, it's probably 14 hours worth of work. It's a lot of work for one, one little episode. So that said, um, that's usually the problem. That's usually where the, the communication fell out. Now some of it is the director's fault, like mispronunciation of names. Uh, and luckily now we have tools on the internet. There are places you can go on the internet to just hear how a word is pronounced. Oh well, yeah, I have like, it's, you think it's part, they're not informed. Do you think they're getting better at that? Like, Yeah, yeah, better definitely. Better the, I think now where the screw-ups happen is where they try to be funny. Like, honestly, 90% of the problems that I've seen recently come from, oh, this isn't funny enough, let's fix it. Mm, no, if the show did well enough by itself, we don't have to fix it. And this is coming from somebody that works on ghost stories. <laughs> I know when it needs to be finessed. But uh, that, you know, that said, um, and there's been, there's actually been a show where, and I won't tell you what show, but there was a show that made a really nasty crack at anime fans. I just wouldn't say it. I was like, I'm sorry, that's my name that's going to be on this at the end of the day, and I'm not going to say it. Why? It's funny. I was like, no, it's not. It's insulting. I was like, you're making fun of the very people that are buying this. I'm not going to say it. And like, that's one of those times where I might not have worked with that director a lot after that, but I'm fine with that. Like, I, I'm, I, I've got to put my name on it. At the end of the day, if it's making fun of somebody that I, I feel is innocent, I'm not going to do it. So. Man, I'm already losing my voice. It's Friday. What the hell? Uh, Gatorade. I'm going to quench my thirst. Anyway, but yeah, that's, but usually, wow, I just spilled it everywhere. Uh, but that's usually where it happens is ADR writing. And that's why I have a lot of respect for a good ADR writer. We could have never done number six had we not had good scripts. Had that show had one bad script, it would have been like somebody throwing a wrench in a, in a fine-tuned machine. Like, 
Uh, but luckily we had just phenomenal scripts and we could just blaze through the work really fast and uh, luckily it was also like Lucy Christian, myself, Hilary Haig, Dave Walls, it was people that this isn't their first show and, and we kind of knew what we were doing ahead of time. So who's got another question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I couldn't really point about uh, hate mail. I mean, I've dealt with some hate mail sometimes, but from playing puzzles and whatnot. But yeah, yeah. I, I remember at a well, panel like a couple of years ago, where there, where I don't know if it was, but it was a few people out of the panel that advised that if you get a news feed, you try to avoid reading on the internet about your world war. I don't tell people that just because I'm an internet geek and I live on the internet, like. Constantly, my computer's logged in upstairs right now. Um, that said, you can't take anything anybody says on the internet seriously. Someone telling you they're going to kill you. Well, let's see. If you're really going to kill me, would you put it an announcement of it on the internet? Like, I have to take everything I read on the internet with a grain of salt. I also know that it's really easy to critique something someone else is doing. So, like, you know, when somebody wants to talk about what a rotten actor I am, I usually say, well, when you have a dub, I'll listen to your dub. You know, or uh, when you create something, then I'll, I'll judge you on it. But like, that's part of being an artist. You can't be afraid to be criticized because that's just part of what you do. As many people love what you do, there will equally be people that hate what you do. I love that I can get on the internet and see hateful things people that have never written me, that never met me, have things to say about me. And I'm like, you don't even know me. I hate Greg Eric. He did a ruin Enigma. I'm like. It's still in Japanese, idiot, hit the button. Like, we didn't change the, the Japanese language track at all. But like, it's just weird. When you put yourself out there, like, there's just gonna be people that don't like you. And I don't care, like, uh, that person doesn't sleep in the bed with me, sign my check, or feed my dog. So, uh, that's, that's the importance level right there. Not maybe in that order. Sometimes my dogs take first priority. But, uh, they're nice enough to let me live in their house, but. <laughs> Like sometimes I, I kind of fun with it, and, but other times I'm just like, I, I, I not actually, we're going to talk about tomorrow. That's something Brianna and I were talking about. We're going to talk about during the It Gets Better panel. Like, how, how do you know how to draw the line? Like, things people say do hurt your feelings, but the game of internet, you can't let anyone know that. <coughs> like, you have to have that one confidant that's like, uh, can I just call you and cry right now? Like, but you can't, you can't, you have to keep a good game face on the internet. You can't ever let anybody know something got to you or that it's open season on you. Or, so. like the one uh, guy I watched, or the one that, like, he made a whole, he makes video series about the quest for hate mail with Dark Souls. Uh, uh, nobody should want hate mail, it's not that much fun. It's poorly written and there's very little punctuation. Oh yeah, what makes it fun to read because you just read it as one long run on sentence. <laughs> and sometimes it's it's voice messages over Xbox Live. That's where you get some of the best things. Oh uh, well one of the the guy that plays the voice of the cat in um, Ghost Stories is actually a he's a podcaster also. He's a group of a bunch of uh, comedians. This I think this is brilliant. They're called the Whiskey Brothers. Uh, and it's uh, www.praisewhiskey.com. It should be called a whiskey, with whiskey like reverends or whatever. But they're a group of raunchy comedians who drink whiskey and tell raunchy jokes, and now people send them whiskey. <laughs> win, total win. And so he, uh, like, you know, he he has. They have a they have a drunk hate mail, like a drunk number that you can call and send them hateful messages. And they play them during their podcast. They think it's funny, like whatever. Here's some drunk person from Las Vegas. I hate you, with you, bro. Like it's so funny. So maybe I need to set up a Google number for hate mail. That would be fun. The problem is like. If you listen to it at the wrong time, it can bum you out. Like if you just watch a scary movie and somebody says something kind of creepy. By the way, who is excited for the new Silent Hill video game? What? Come on, there's got to be some horror nuts in the room. Have y'all? How many of y'all played the demo? It's sick. It's so sick. I had my friend play it just so I could watch him get the crap scared out of him. I turn off all the lights. I'm like, here, you need to play with the headphones on too. And I was just like, oh. Waiting for him to freak out, so that's although, great. Although, because of the recent disagreement between Hideo Kojima and Konami, it's like a lot of people are kind of worried about that. No, because it's Studio 227, or it's Studio whatever, it's it's uh, Kojima's studio, so like, it's not, it doesn't I mean, he can continue to work on it in, in regard, with disregard for the, the fracture between him and Konami. 
And it's, and it's still like that got Guillermo del Toro. Oh, right hell yeah, it's got Guillermo del Toro in it. <laughs> that was, and Norman Reedus, and Walking Dead fans, Norman Reedus. How can you hate that game? Nobody, nobody can hate that game. I, I, I don't hate the game, but just no. some people are kind of worried about the project. But and, like, naysayers. I'm more a fan of the lore of Oregon, more so than the actual horror that happens on screen. Nah, I like being, I like having the poops kicked out of me. The best thing about it is there is a hallway in my house that looks just like the hall from PT. So like after I played it and I had to go to the bathroom, I was like, um, really? And my boyfriend was just like, <laughs> he could see it when he was watching the game. He's like, that looks just like the back hallway. And sure enough, as I had to turn the corner, I'm like, uh, okay. But I don't believe in the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or anything like that. So if you can scare me, you've done something good. So I love it. So I love being scared. Yeah, I was. So, sorry. Oh, I was gonna say we got another question. Somebody's got another question. Yeah. Like, are we gonna keep talking? Yes. Are we gonna keep uh, talking about Silent Hill? Well, yeah. Sorry, been asked, but um, in regards to when um, you guys usually get cast for shows. Yeah. Do they? Does it seems like Funimation lately has been um, dubbing everything. Do they usually wait until the, the series is leaked over for that season, or do they actually start as a simulcast? Or? They're going to be doing some simulcast events pretty soon that are going to be airing like just minutes after they air in Japan. So um, doing those shows is really tricky. We did one at ADB Films. There was a show called Girl Power, and uh, it was going to be released in the U.S. and Japan at the same time. Now, by a technical error, it released two hours early in the States before it came out in Japan, which is like... <laughs> but that was just like a, you know, an error. But um, it released like the night... Somebody sold it the night before. I think it was Rights Hub or somebody. I can't remember. But like it came out early. Uh, doing that takes a lot of coordination between the two studios, and I will say that's something that the Japanese could improve on a little bit, is their ability to work quickly with the American studios, because everything we do is dependent on materials coming from them, and sometimes those materials don't happen until like the last minute. <laughs> so it's tough to prepare anything when you're waiting on materials. Uh, that said, like, I think these new things that Funimation has entered into with these studios, like, that, that's a given. Uh, in order to be able to do these things fast, we have to have like total cooperation. So uh, they're really excited about it. So I'm, I'm excited. Anything that gets anime here quicker, all in favor of. Because I'm from the old school days where it was like three or four years before something would come over. So now the fact that we can get something just years after it's been in Japan or even a year after it's been in Japan is fantastic. Uh, to imagine it's here at the same time is crazy. Is absolutely crazy, but we have so much now. We have Crunchyroll, we have Hulu, we have Netflix, and we can watch anime. You know, on Netflix, you can change the audio options. You can watch in Japanese or English, which is fantastic. So, um, really, like that, a lot is changing in that in that regard, and it's really interesting to see how far the industry is caught up with the demand lately. Because I remember doing panels where we were talking about what the industry was doing for us and why piracy was such a huge issue and it's funny because in those few years the industry has kind of caught up and they've lowered prices and they're working faster and they're making subtitled versions available way ahead of time. I know that Funimation had, was it Data Live, Attack on Titan, Danganronpa and something else all available as soon as they acquired the rights to them. They were like up in subtitle form almost instantly. And that's cool because if somebody just wants to watch them legally in, you know, Japanese, they're making those things available free or cheap or immediate. Um, and then if you want the dub, those are like usually six months or whatever to follow or whatever. So um, I think it's neat to watch that process change. How much, what do we have? Huh? No, oh, do you know how much time we have? Oh, wait, I've got a phone. Hang on. You're perfectly fine. 15 minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, hang on. Ray Pulse is here, I think. Hang on. It would be my luck that he shows up when I'm uh, on a panel. No, he's not here yet. He just sent me a picture of a bottle of liquor, which is a way to get my attention usually when I'm on a panel. So, uh, yeah. But did you get into DJing and what are some of your favorite types of electronic music? That's my favorite question. Uh, I've been DJing since I was 16, so technically I've been doing music longer than I've been doing anything else. Uh, I got started because I used to be that guy that annoyed the DJ all night long, and I hung it. I hung out in the DJ booth. I'm like, "What's that song? How do you? What, why do you keep pushing that knob? What is that?" I was like, this obnoxious little 16 year old kid. And that DJ got sick one night, and his sister was a good friend of mine, 
and Veronica called me. She goes, Robert wants to know if you can come play music at the club. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And she goes, yeah, Robert says you've watched everything he's done for like a month. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And Robert got on the phone. He was like almost bedridden with pneumonia. And he goes, look, dude, this is the only chance you're going to ever get to dig through my records. And that's all you had to say. <laughs> I need to just look at all your records. Because, you know, when you're outside the booth, you just see a DJ going, well, they're all the records, and you don't know what, but it's like magic. They have everything. And so that night, when I wasn't playing, my back was turned. I was, like, just looking through all the records at what was there. And I'm sure that night was horrible and awful, but I learned slowly, and I've continued to do music. Now I, I do music events that have nothing to do with anime conventions. My favorite part about those events I play nerdy music because I play a lot of video game music and stuff like that. The nerdy tracks go over even bigger at not nerd events than they do at nerd events, which I find really funny. Uh, and there's some there's some really cool new people that are doing really really nerdy dance music. I like that. Um, even like anime specific. Wait, how many? Any Deontward fans in the room by any chance? Deontward? Any? Uh, okay, two, three, yay! But do y'all have the new album, uh, Donker Mog? There is an Azumanga Dayo joke in that album. They sing the cooking song at the end of, I can't say the name of the song, it's got every word in it, but uh, the girl I want to, anyway, that song, at the end of it, she sings the cooking song from Azumanga Dayo, which Monica Real freaked out. She's like, Dion would turn my voice because they'd have to, know, they'd have to have watched it in English to know the cooking is fun. So they actually sing the little song. So, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of people, there's actually, we were watching uh, one of their videos and there's a Parappa the Rapper joke in one of their older videos and I was like, what? That was a Parappa call out. And they're like, really? So uh, I think it's cool. There's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of people that are into nerd culture that are making music now. That are, it's not just like, you know, old rock and roll guys or whatever. It's nerdy people making music. Skrillex is the biggest nerd there is. Oh my God, so nerdy. He is the only person I know that can just find random sound clips off the internet and turn it into a big song. But, uh, so yeah, so um, that call 911 now is my favorite because it's this lady giving a bunch of skaters a hard time. And she's screaming at them to stop skating. And she's like, call 911 now. And when you see the clip, it's funnier because it's just this old broad yelling at a bunch of kids. But uh, she's like, I'm calling the police. But, uh, and then the oh my gosh from the Scary Monster song is the Cup Stacking Girl. So, I mean, like, uh, yeah, Zed is a big nerd, too. Zed did a Zelda track. So, yeah, there's a lot of really good people. My favorite producers right now, um, I just went to England and uh, went to this huge rave put on by Hospital Records, or it's called a party. They don't call them raves there. Uh, and I got to see this Japanese DJ that I'm going to play some of his music tomorrow night. His name is Makoto. He's fantastic. He takes American R&B music and does drum and bass rips of it. So I'm gonna play Happy, even though I hate that song. Uh, because he's found a version of that song that I'm like, yeah. Um, there's a lot of producers that I really like right now. There's these guys called um, Level Up that I'm playing. That I've got a really fantastic Red Hot Chili Peppers mix that they did. Uh, High Contrast is a drum and bass producer. I'm actually playing Tupac. I know it's hard to believe. Uh, but he did a remix of California Love that I love right now. Obviously, the guys from uh, Pendulum, who are now Knife Party, I love their work. I was so excited to hear them playing Crush. After closing ceremonies, they were playing Pendulum. I was like, they're playing Crush. Somebody's playing Pendulum. Uh, they just did a show in Houston right before I left to come here. So, uh, But um, I don't know. There's a lot of music. I listen to a lot of music that's not dance music, too. I listen to a lot of rock music. And uh, I have a flogging, uh, no, Dropkick Murphy song that I'm going to play tomorrow night. I know, hard to believe, but I have a dance mix of a Dropkick Murphy song. Uh, and uh, just, I listen to so much. I'm as nerdy with music as I am with like other things, like video games and stuff. So like, and just as ADD, so I'm like, oh, Dionne Word, oh, Skinny Puppy, like, it's just <laughs> back and forth. So, uh, but yeah, so that's, yeah, I, I could talk about music for a whole panel, I think. In fact, with Whitey and I, Whitey Cracker and I did a whole panel about DJing and uh, two years ago, I guess. Who's got a, yes, there's a cane in the back of the room. All you have to do is wave a prop, and that gets my attention, usually. Um, 
Since we're on the subject of music, I yeah. know you did your own singing for the dub of that. Oh yeah, we did actually. Have you ever thought of actually doing a concert of just singing? We just did. Oh, okay. I just did. It was a one-time only event. Um, the kid, I know, that's a shitty way to put it. You just missed it. Uh, the kid, who was my inspiration for Koyuki at the time, uh, is a little kid named Sam Biggs. He lives in Chicago. He's come to the detour a few times. Uh, when he was first working on the, uh, when we were first started working on the show, he was like this little 14-year-old kid teaching himself how to play guitar. But he was disgustingly talented and had a real, like, go get him attitude. And so that was who I based my version of Koyuki off of, was this kid, Sam Biggs. Well, now he's in a big deal band in Chicago called the Cheyenne Line, and they're doing really well, and they're fantastic. He's got, like, as strong a scene voice as the kid from Saves the Day. He's just got this powerful tenor voice. And uh, I, so I booked the bands for OhioCon, and I said, hey, why don't, I know you guys want to do a pet cover thing, do y'all want to be my secondary band this year at Ohio? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we were talking about it. We'd love to do it. I didn't know they thought I was going to sing for it. <laughs> and so then he's like, yeah, and, and, uh, and you know all the songs already. And I'm like, wait, uh, I'm also a double department head and a guest and DJ. and I, like." But he's like, oh, man, this would be great. And so I couldn't let him down. I'm like, yeah, we'll do it. Well, then we had to find somebody to sing Chiba's stuff because... We're not going to bring Justin Cook out just to rap, you know. So, like, we got uh, uh, Dr. Awkward, the nerdcore rapper, to do Chiba's stuff. And he was sick. He was so good. But the crazy thing that I don't think anybody in the audience knew is the first show we did was the first time we ever performed together. We were a band that existed clearly just on the internet. We would record things and send it back and forth to each other, and we call them scratch tracks. And that's how we rehearsed. So our sound check was the first time we had ever played together. I cheated. I got one rehearsal in Chicago, but it was after a con, so I had this much voice, and I was trying to sing, and I finally had to just whistle, because I couldn't sing, and they couldn't hear me, so I was like... <laughs> so like, but the cool thing about the concert that we did, Brad Swale, who lives in Canada, which Beck played on MTV in Canada, or Much Music, it's like their, their MTV, um, and it was public, like you could just watch it. They, in fact, it, it fully aired before the first disc dropped here, which is kind of cool, because Canada doesn't get you know, anime first, usually. So that was cool. This guy got to watch it before you did. He's from, uh, I, he's from, I, missed, I missed that one. It was you that got me to watch it. Oh, really? You didn't see it when it was on Much Music? No, I Oh my gosh, you had a chance to watch it first. Well, um, anyway, when we did the show, um, uh, we had to cut certain songs out of it. Uh, and so we, when we got the show together, Brad Swale wanted to perform with us. So Brad came on and did an acoustic version of Slip Out, which is fantastic. Uh, probably the most beautiful version of it I've ever heard. And, but when he contacted me, he goes, hey, uh, I want to play with your band. And I'm like, uh, okay, we're a band. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> He's like, I want to sing Slip Out. I'm like, that is pretty ballsy, dude. That's my song. Like, I was just like, really? <laughs> And then he sent me this version of it, and so I got talking with Sam, I was like, what if we let Brad come on and do this very soft, like, lovey-dovey version of Slip Out, and the audience will think that's the only Slip Out they get, and then when we come on for the encore, we'll do the rip-roaring Nirvana version, you know, the crazy one. But the coolest thing is, we started the encore with the song we had to cut out of the show, which was the Beatles' I Gotta Feel It, uh, because we didn't have the rights to use it. In fact, the Japanese didn't even have the rights to use it, that's why we couldn't use it. Um, <laughs> Funny how that works. The funny thing is, the company that owns the rights to that song is a Japanese company. So uh, I'm shocked that they got away with using it the first time. But um, so we did I Got a Feeling. Uh, we did uh, two cover songs, because we did two shows. We did a, a warm up show. And so we did a Saves the Day song and a Alkaline Trio song, which was fun to get to see those songs as well. Uh, and then the night show is just all back, but it was fantastic. And uh, it's called, we have a webpage for it called Project Peck. And we were supposed to be doing some more shows, but we've, I think, now lost a member of the band. I'm not sure. So it may be literally a one time only event, which is cool. The good thing is it was all videotaped. And so slowly videos are starting to surface on that webpage. But yeah, it was called Project Peck. It was a lot of fun. It was, it was awesome. The, probably the biggest complaint were the two directors from Beck were mad they couldn't go to see it, and that's why we were supposed to perform it again. So they're like, can we, can we get them to perform at this con? Because I didn't get to see it. So 
it was fun. But yeah, it was a lot of fun working on that music too. We recorded an album, but we can't release it because of the rights, so, which sucks. So bad. Anyway, uh, another question. Yes. Yes, well, uh, right now, I mean, that's a really interesting question because people that are interested in becoming a voice actor were like, okay, well, you know, you start doing theater and they're like, no, I just want to do anime. Like, no, that's not the way it works. Um, I do only anime right now because it's what I'm getting a lot of work doing. Uh, but I did a Nissan Sentra commercial a while ago, like a few years ago, that I only said like two sentences and I made what would take me two weeks making an anime. So. If somebody goes, hey, we want you to sell this Dodge Dart, I would be like, Dodge Dart, yeah, best car ever. Like, <laughs> I drive one and it's awesome. Like, because every time it plays on the radio, you get a small cut of that, and like, it's really cool. It's a super good gig. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, and it all depends on what your voice is good for. Like, uh, my voice is good for selling season passes to Six Flags because I sound like I'm 16. <laughs> but like, I'm probably not the guy. I'm not gonna be the be all that you can be. In the U.S. military, you know, like, I'm not gonna ever be that guy because I don't have that voice. I sound like, that I couldn't do 10 push-ups, like, but I sound like the kid that, like, got really drunk and watched a lot of cartoons late at night once you go to Astro World, but, uh, but yeah, it's about where your voice is marketable, and uh, I'd like to do more theater, but it just is too much of a time commitment. You see when you do a show, there's, like, uh, usually a six-week to eight-week rehearsal process, and then two months of every weekend, and I do so many conventions, I can't do theater, because I'm like, oh, well, I gotta go to a con, like, so, yeah. How do you keep your voice healthy after all this time? I mean, it gets... The pro, yeah, okay, so you hear how rough it sounds right now. Right. Uh, in the booth, we usually have water, iced tea, Coke, coffee, whatever, we stay hydrated. The problem is when we go to a convention, you just talk nonstop, and there's not, like, I can't be like, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, and you hear the difference already in my voice, but uh, there's lots of tricks. Um, there's this, now this, there's this stuff we drink called black sludge. It's a Chinese herbal cough medicine called Nim Jam Pepequa. And we call it Hulk juice because the guy that is the voice of the Hulk uses it when he can't. And it's, it's this honey and loquat syrup that comes out like tar. It pours out like in slow motion. It is so thick and so gross. It's like, imagine licorice with like six tons of sugar in it. And that's, I mean, it's, it's really not as bad for you as it sounds, uh, but we do that. There is this other stuff we use if you have to rescue your voice. It's called, fart, we call it fart juice because it's orange juice, organic apple cider vinegar, and honey. And something about that combination gives you the winds. Uh, it's not like a tuba. Uh, and the first thing is, I learned that when I was on stage. When we were doing stage, great story. Um, and we were doing a production of Godspell, and everybody lost their voice. Well, Godspell is a very music intensive show. Well, so during the crucifixion scene, where everyone is like bowed down, and we're literally forehead to butthole on stage. And this is so good. My mother, who is a Sunday school teacher, will probably die when she sees this. One of the young ladies in the show, like, well, once one person on stage starts laughing, it's like herpes. Everybody gets it. And so there was this sea of shaking shoulders, and we're all just crying, laughing on stage. Because it didn't just happen once. Everybody saw it. Like, and it was so funny, nobody could stop. My friends that were in the audience were like, y'all all look like y'all were really crying. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah. I only knew what we were doing on stage. So yeah, so that's the story behind Fart Juice. And Fart Juice is actually um, a friend of ours who was an opera singer that had vocal surgery. She had nodes and she had that thing where they cut the nodules off your vocal cords. That's what he gave her to recover, to, so that she could be an op, you know, like, so she could build her voice back up and be healthy, like, drink this every hour on the hour, which is how you're supposed to do it, which I'm sure is why it upsets your stomach the way it does. But uh, that said, uh, there's other tricks, like, if your mouth is super spitty, uh, some studios will keep green apples, and if you eat green apples, it cuts down on the amount of in your voice. Um, 
some people, like, it's really weird. Some people tell you to avoid caffeine, like coffee, and but I have sinus problems. So caffeine is like a natural sinus fixer for me. So I drink, usually I come into the studio with a big thing of coffee and a big thing of iced tea. And I'm like, hot and cold, whatever I need. Like, but um, there's all kinds of different remedies. The thing is, as an actor, you just can't blow your voice. You can't, like, if you notice, if you're in the crowd with me at a concert or during his opening ceremonies or something, I'm the person whistling. Because I don't go, yeah, anymore. Like, that just destroys your voice. Or like, if you're at a concert and everybody's screaming the name of the band, I'm like. <laughs> like, so I have, to, I have to just make sure that I don't, you know, hurt myself. And the other thing is, as much as I hate to say it, Greg, don't say it. Sleep, you have to get sleep, even though I hate sleep. Sleep is the enemy. Uh, sometimes after a convention, all it takes is me just sleeping a good 16 hours, maybe 16, that would be good. Uh, and I'm, I'm good as gold again. So it's just a matter of just taking care of yourself. But we do have dirty little tricks, that, with some of them dirty, uh, fart juice, uh, that we can use if we need to rest restore our voice. Yeah? I don't know, it depends. What are those two questions? Okay. I don't know. Okay. I'm not in charge of that. Second, that was easy. <laughs> since, uh, how, again, as you grow very, very busy, that you don't get a lot of time to develop a lot of video games. <laughs> the hell you say? <laughs> I have in my house. I have a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, an Xbox 360, a PlayStation, a PlayStation 4, a Neo Geo, and I think a GameCube. I'm not sure. Do we, I think we got rid of the GameCube. But yeah. So, no, I don't play video games at all. I'll just say this. I can't go to the bathroom without Metal Slug. Just saying. Because my Neo Geo has a detachable and I can play Metal Slug on the toilet. Who doesn't love Metal Slug on the toilet? <laughs> Dabbled in, or at least looked at anything in the Souls brand, like Demon's Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2. Uh, no, no, I do, I'm, no, I haven't. <coughs> uh, you should, you should probably look, look at those. I mean, I mean, uh, if you're not you should like the kind of third person, you know, you'd be back to time I'm not an RPG person. I, like I said, very ADD. <laughs> <laughs> anything that's not go, 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 go. I watch other people play RPGs, and I'm like, I would love to know how to combine pieces of a weapon to, I'm going to go make something to eat. Like, I, I literally have no attention span at all. Like, I call it my squirrel brain. I literally have a squirrel brain. So, yeah. yeah. Nah, it's got to be zombies. Shooting zombies in the face. That's my favorite thing. Left for Dead is my jam. I love Left for Dead. Uh, yes. No. Why would I ruin a computer with video games? I have consoles for that. I used to be a, a PC tech. I watched so many people destroy computers, loading things on them. No, I'm gonna play, because I can never blow out my PlayStation. Yeah? Uh, going back to the point made about um, doing things outside, or commercial stuff outside of anime. Yeah, yeah. I know I've heard your brother's voice in a couple commercials recently. How does that happen? I do these companies come to you guys, or do you actually? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, like the Nissan thing was, they were looking, um, they were looking to pitch to a certain market. Like they were looking to pitch to college age kids that they wanted the like, like, hey, Nissan Sentra is a good first car. <laughs> no, it's not. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was the whole gig, was like, hey, this is a good college car. And so then, then they jumped down that rabbit hole. They're like, oh, who sounds like a kid? And the weird thing is there's this dude in California that sounds like me, and he's the kid that was on the Tokyo Pop commercial uh, like a few summers ago, and everybody's like, Man, I love that Tokyo Pop commercial. I'm like, yeah, but it's not me. No, it's you. I'm like, no, it's not me, dude. No, I swear to God, it's you. No, I swear to God, it's not me, dude. Like, so uh, Talison finally told me, he's like, yeah, that's the guy that we get for anything that would be right for you. He's like, that's, that's our Greg Ayers. And I was like, that's so weird that you even call it that. But uh, so yeah, so there's somebody that sounds like me. What? I'm just curious what you heard my brother's voice on that. I, I thought for sure he was the voice for the um, McDonald's commercial. No, no. Oh my God, my brother would be rolling in money if he did a McDonald's commercial. <laughs> well, just like it. There's, a, there's a Wendy's commercial that sounds just like C. Christian. And like, so much so that people that work with her are like, hey, congrats. She goes, no, I wish I did. I would be rich. Like, <laughs> it's a national, like a national commercial like that on television. That's ridiculous money. That's 
don't know, that's like house payment money. So, uh, yeah. Deborah Bai, the girl that, she doesn't do voice acting anymore, but she was the voice of Boogie Pop and Boogie Pop Phantom. She did a looping for a film, which is basically where you come in and let's say like, in her case it was, um, not Laura Dern, but it was some female movie star who just couldn't be bothered to fix a piece of audio, and so they hire people that can voice match. She did six loops, which was under an hour's work. <coughs> it paid her rent on her New York apartment for three months. Oh. One little one hour session was like, and have all the money. <laughs> so I always think of money when somebody's like, I don't want to sell, I don't want to do commercials. Like, why? Do you hate money? <laughs> so, yeah, it's great. It's great when you get those gigs, but I'll tell my brother he's got to call McDonald's for his money. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. We had, so far, we haven't done any nationals yet. Uh, Jason Douglas, who's a voice actor, has done a lot of films recently. He was in Sin City and a bunch of other stuff. So, and of course, Brina Palencia was on Walking Dead, and she was on that other science fiction TV show. So there are some people breaking out into breaking out into some new territory. Um, but yeah, how much time do we have? We're out of time. We're five minutes over. That's probably why we have new people coming in. They're like, this isn't the Smash Brothers panel. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I am done until the old school anime panel at nine, and uh, see you guys there. Thank you all for being here.